Um, so, John, you're very, very welcome to um, the IIEA. John is Managing Director of D Digital Investment Banking in Banco Santander, and not the UK, but Banco Santander, the, the, the broader, uh, almost global bank. Um, John's uh, experience comes from engineering, uh, from trading, I, I guess, proprietary trading, in fact, in, in, in Chicago, to uh, his own startup business, um, to eventually Santander, uh, bringing with him to Santander a host of, uh, a legion of learning experiences. Um, and I would guess, though he didn't say so downstairs, that some of them were quite hard experiences and others were, were probably uh, the, 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 the formation of the man. I'll ask him maybe to introduce himself a little bit before he moves into his presentation because uh, I get the impression that there's a lot of learning for all of us in his life story as well as in the, uh, the presentation. I'll just say on behalf of the IIEA that you're all very welcome. Some of you are members, others of you are honored guests. Um, IIEA is uh, spending a good deal of time and attention to uh, digital issues and to blockchain and you'll have seen from our program that there's been a, a series of events on that topic um, and this is uh, one of those but I think it, uh, it risks being one of the, the best of those, um, not that they haven't all been good. So John, please. Uh, sure, Kevin, thank you very much for the uh, introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to come and talk. Um, I'm from Carlo originally and uh, did my engineering degree in Dublin, UCD, and like many people in the early 90s, emigrated to the United States as an immigrant with no job, no money, nowhere to live, looking up at skyscrapers, thinking, what the hell am I going to do now? And uh, managed to uh, work for a while as an engineer, did an MBA in finance, became a, a trader at the Chicago Board Options Exchange in the trading pits, uh, entered the management consulting business, left that, founded a startup, which became a blockchain startup, one of the early ones in... Um, 2012, uh, raised money twice, spent it and failed, and went back to consulting and ended up consulting for several banks, one of which is now my employer, Banco Santander, which I joined in 2016 to run the blockchain lab, one of the very first bank-run blockchain labs that was experimenting with uh, the technology properly. And more recently then, I left the blockchain lab inside the bank and joined uh, a new unit in the uh, investment bank called a digital investment bank, which is really the warehouse for our advanced technology programs, including blockchain, distributed ledger, artificial intelligence, robotics, and other things. Although, even though I'm responsible for all of these things globally, I am actually the, pro the program manager for our blockchain digital assets program internally, which is actually my, my own technical expertise. Anyway, um, I'm going to give a, a quick talk. I give a I prefer using this. I give a lot of talks. Can everybody hear me okay? Do I need this or not? Um, I give a lot of talks on different topics related to blockchain technology, whether that's in front of regulators <coughs> across the world, whether it's business leaders in Banco Santander, uh, and groups such as this, which have a, right, a wide range of different skills and expertise. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through quickly um, some foundational concepts about why we're here, get into why this technology is actually important for banks and the financial industry more broadly, and then more specifically some of the things that we are doing along with other banks like Credit Suisse, for example, and other large global banks <coughs> that are moving this technology almost to the point where it's going to become somewhat ubiquitous in the financial industry. All right, so being an engineer, I always like to go back to first principles, and I like to start with the history of finance going all the way back to the very beginning. So there are two problems that have existed in finance since day one, day zero. Number one is the concept of counterparty risk. Now, what does that mean? If you've got gold in your hand, there is no counterparty to that gold. But if you accumulate a lot of gold, it's too heavy to carry. You've got to store it somewhere. So I give my gold to Kevin. I say, Kevin, you store the gold. And Kevin, gi Kevin gives me a paper ticket in return. That ticket is a claim against the gold in Kevin's gold vault. We are counterparties to a transaction. I have to trust that Kevin will redeem the gold when I go to redeem the gold. Anyway, this idea seems great, but what actually happened is the gold vault operators realized they could issue as many tickets as they wanted because nobody ever came to redeem the gold. That's where fractional reserve was born. We'll get into that in a second. Problem number one in, in finance counterparty risk. 
Problem number two in finance is related. It's counterfeiting risk. How do you know that the gold is real? Well, you don't, until our friend Archimedes appeared. Story's famous, he ran naked through the streets of Athens, shouting Eureka. He had discovered a way to prove that the gold was real, using the laws of physics. Does anybody here remember the equation for density? Very good, mass over volume. <laughs> A plus. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so our friend Archimedes had figured out a way to prove that the gold was real. So two problems in finance, counterparty risk, counterfeiting risk. Now, extrapolate forward to today's financial system. We have 25,000 banks in the world with banking licenses. We've got a million non-bank financial institutions, asset managers, hedge fund, pension funds, hedge funds, other stuff. And we're all counterparties to each other's transactions. All of this built on a system of fractional reserve where we hope, we do not know, but we hope that 10% of all the assets, all the cash in existence is on deposit in a central bank, right? And we can imagine that a precarious system that's built on this leverage that's opaque has some potential systemic problems. We all know what happened in 2007, 2008. My father spent 42 years with AIB uh, at the branch level. There was chaos in Ireland and all over the world. We know that. Thankfully, we're out of it. It looks great here in Dublin these days, actually. Let's not make the same mistake again, please, folks. Blame the banks, then. Anyway, so in 2009, something new came along, and this new t thing was called Bitcoin. I won't get into the details too much, but Bitcoin was designed to operate entirely separate from the financial industry, to be its own min mini financial system by itself. And in its, within the context of its own <coughs> network, it solves the two problems in finance. It solves counterfeiting risks, it solves counterparty risk, and it also solves a third problem from computer science, which us geeks would know about, PhD in artificial intelligence. Yes, sorry. Byzantine generous problem. How a distributed system reaches agreement on the overall state of the system. Interesting stuff. Anyway. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is essentially a payment system. It was designed to be, and this is a direct quote from the white paper that described it originally, peer-to-peer um, -peer electronic cash. It's a payment system. And it's really three things. It's a secure distributed database or ledger. So it's a, there's a, a record, a ledger, of all the transactions in the Bitcoin network up running all over the world, many, many copies. Number two, it's a communication protocol, so the ledger has the ability to communicate with itself. In other words, to reach agreement on the state of the ledger, so it's got a, the records are true. And number three then, Bitcoin, and this was the something new, Bitcoin is also a digital token. It's this idea of there's a digital representation of value in the ledger, and in Bitcoin's purposes, it serves two functions. Number one is as an anti-spam mechanism. The ledger is open. In order to enter a transaction into the uh, ledger, you actually have to record or pay some small amount of Bitcoin. That limits the amount of transactions that could occur. And then number two, it also serves as an incentive mechanism. Some operators of the ledger validate and process transactions. That term in Bitcoin terminology is known as mining. I won't get into the reasons why or how it actually works. But some parts of the ledger operators validate transactions and they get rewarded by the ledger itself. And that ledger is known as a blockchain. Why is it called blockchain? It's a nice buzzword. It's called blockchain simply because Bitcoin is inefficient and has the ability only to validate transactions every 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes, block of transactions validated. 10 minutes later, block of transactions validated. 10 minutes later, block of transactions validated. Now they're linked together. These blocks of transactions are linked together using mathematics, cryptography, that's okay. But what you have is block, 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 chain of blocks. <coughs> That's all it means. That's what blockchain means. It's no more than that. It's a very simple concept. Okay. Now, so all of this has led to an explosion of what are known as cryptocurrencies. This idea that you can have this dig these digital representations of value out there trading in the marketplace. This is a deep topic by itself. Um, working for a bank, I'm not even supposed to talk about cryptocurrencies, but that's the world that I came from. I got inspired by Bitcoin in 2012 and started asking questions, how did it actually work? And went down the rabbit hole, which by the way, never ends. Am I right? Yes, Laurie's laughing too. Um, and there are tons of cryptocurrencies out there. And when, we, when you hear about blockchain on uh, you know, CNBC and Bloomberg, that's what they're really talking about. They're talking about the active liquid market for cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ether, XRP, Litecoin, 
All of these things that people don't understand why they have value. There are very good reasons, I think, why they have value. It's a topic for another time. I'm happy to chat about that perhaps uh, during Q&A. Okay, so what we have with Bitcoin, starting with Bitcoin, is this idea of a shared ledger, this golden record, this universal source of truth where my copy of the ledger is the same as your copy of the ledger, and I know it's true because of the power of mathematics and cryptography. There's something there. Now, there's lots of discussions about different flavors. Some of these ledgers are public. Some of these ledgers are private. Banks are more inclined to operate private permissioned ledgers where we restrict access to the ledger systems to other banks. Um, I would say up until recently, the public ledger systems have not been particularly interesting, although that is changing. And it's changing because the technology is evolving. It's becoming more performant, it's becoming uh, more secure, and it's becoming uh, easier to understand how to use from a legal and regulatory point of view. We did some of that recently ourselves. Now, this idea of ledgers and records begs the question, and this is where I try and connect the work that's come before from the public open source blockchain world with banks. What is a bank? A bank is just a ledger. It's a record of who owns what. Now, of course, banks are special ledgers because you know they're wrapped up in regulation. Our bank, well, it's called Partnon, it's written in COBOL, we have COBOL engineers were taken out. If anybody here programs COBOL, <coughs> you have a job tomorrow. <laughs> you might have to move to Madrid, but you got a job tomorrow. Uh, and it lives, it's a COBOL mainframe system, and it lives inside an IBM Z series mainframe. I've never seen it. I've seen a photograph of this thing. It's as big as this room. I don't know why. Anyway, but we're, we'll migrate off it eventually. But these ledger systems that banks have are very complicated. They're very cumbersome, and every bank has its own ledger. So John Bank has John Ledger's, Ke Kevin's Bank has Kevin's Ledger, multiplied by 25,000. And one of the big problems is we do business with each other, but we don't trust each other, right? So John Bank does business with Kevin Bank. We don't trust each other. And because of that, we've got a huge amount of reconciliation, auditing, CCPs, central clearing parties, CSDs, central securities depositors, regulators, <laughs> auditors, compliance, all of these things that essentially are there to verify that my ledger, <coughs> is the same, but opposite, of Kevin's ledger, multiplied by 25,000 plus the million non-bank financial institutions on top. We've, completed, we've co created a system, architecture it's called, of the financial industry of many banks, many ledgers. Cumbersome, grew organically, wasn't designed by anybody. Okay, so let's imagine a new future. What if the banks, were to share the same ledger. I don't think there'd be just one ledger. I think there'd be lots of ledgers. But let's, let's, let's just say, let's imagine if there was just one ledger for a minute. That means that John Bank and Kevin Bank, we do business together. We don't trust each other, but John Bank trusts the ledger and has a copy. And Kevin Bank does business with Laurie Bank. They don't trust each other, but Kevin Bank trusts the ledger and has a copy. And because of the power of mathematics, cryptography, which are part of the laws of physics, we know that our copies of the ledger are true. And in that regard, we have done exactly the same thing as Archimedes did 3,000 years ago. We have used the laws of physics to solve a human problem, the problem of trust, right? So it's not con the concept about why blockchain or shared ledger, distributed ledger technology is powerful for financial services, it's not. It's, Technology is complicated, but the concept is so simple. It makes sense, right? Now, I don't think there would be just one ledger for everything. There may be a ledger for payments. There may be a ledger for bonds. There could be a ledger for equities. There could be a ledger for derivatives. There could be a ledger for uh, trade finance activities. We trade? Sorry, yes. Um, that's an example of a shared ledger system. And what we're talking about here really is just infrastructure. The internet is infrastructure. So we'll move from a, an architecture of many banks, many ledgers of today to a different world, which will be many banks, fewer ledgers. And the regulators like that because they like the idea that if they had a special you know, lamp, they could shine a light into this ledger and have an understanding of counter positions of counterparts bilaterally, multilaterally, or across the entire system. Systemic risk. And that's why regulators like the answer. So. No need for banks to trust each other, just like today, because we don't. 
but we trust the ledger. Anyway, the killer app in all of this then is this idea of programmability. Our ledger is a special ledger, it's a computer. And what do computers do? They run programs. So this idea of programmable value or programmable money. Now, the buzzword from the blockchain world is called smart contracts. They're not smart and they're not contracts in the legal sense. They're little computer programs, scripts. Persistent scripts is probably a better term. But the world calls them smart contracts. Let's call them smart contracts. This idea that you can attach behavior, automated behavior, to value. Let me give you an example. So over here we have a legal contract. Legal contract. Lawyers, hands up. OK. I spent too much time with you guys. <laughs> so I know something about this, as, as the guy who writes the checks. Um, we take a legal contract, which essentially is, is logic. If, then, what happens? And in a, a security, it's a set of rights and obligations, the cash flows, more or less, layman's person. But you can turn that legal contract, some of it anyway, you can represent it as some of it as code, potentially, particularly simple logic. If something happens, then it's something else. So you take this code, you embed the code in the ledger, and now counterparts to a transaction, let's say we enter into a securities transaction. I buy one, you sell one. And that there's a valuation that needs to be done associated with that transaction, which determines the amount of collateral which needs to get posted by either counterparty. Well, in today's world, that's kind of done manually to a certain extent. And there can be a discrepancy between, as valuations change over time in the market, the amount of collateral that bank a, Kevin Bank or John Bank should be posting. And what actually happens is back office A and back office B get on the phone to each other and we reach some kind of agreement. And if we don't like that, we call these guys and we end up in court. Now, in the future, and that's very cumbersome, a lot of paperwork, back offices. For every front office salesperson in a bank, there are probably five to seven people in the back office performing reconciliation tasks. Right? It's expensive, it's costly, it's error prone. But you can, in the future, be able to take you know, the valuation model, link it to the collateral system as a five lines of code. We're on the same ledger system. We agree implicitly, sign the contract, and we agree that this code represents the valuation model, and it automatically posts collateral as things move. No back office involved. We've agreed that's the code. We both see it. Fine. So this idea of programmable value, programmable money. Contractual behavior encapsulated in code that is visible and agreed to by all parties. Executes automatically based on certain predetermined criteria. Now, think about a bond. Bond is when a company goes out and borrows money, usually has interest payments known as coupons that pay quarterly, and then there's a redemption when the principal is paid back. You can automate the entire thing, right? We've got CCPs, central clearing parties, CSDs, paying agents, calculation agents, all these intermediaries verifying that everything's supposed to work correctly, checking boxes. We can automate all of it. Okay, so um, I work for <coughs> a bank that is mostly retail and commercial, Branches, small businesses, SMEs, small and medium enterprises. Although I work for the investment bank, which deals usually with large uh, corporations and financial institutions. But we looked at use cases across the bank, in retail banking, corporate banking, capital markets. And we start by asking the same three questions that anybody asks regarding technology. When you look at a particular process in a, in a business, it doesn't matter what it is. You ask, is it slow, is it costly, and is it error prone? Well, if the answer is yes, yes, and yes, now you've got, let's do something with technology. And if you add an additional layer on top, which are there are different parties that need to interact together that don't necessarily trust each other, that's a promising use case potentially for some kind of shared ledger technology. And looking at these things, um, how many people here have lived in different countries in their lives? Nearly everybody. International payments, sending dollars, euros in Carlo to dollars in Chicago. Actually, at the time it was pounds, because that's what my father had to do to send me money when I was an immigrant in the United States. It took seven days to get there. Even today, with TransferWise, it can take three to five. Why does it take five days to send money across the world when money and value are just ones and zeros, just data in a machine? Should be instant, right? So, and... Banco Santander, now we actually have blockchain-based international payment system, system that's running on four of our corridors, Brazil, Mexico, San UK, Spain. It'll be on all 10 soon. Instant, 
transfer at very, very tight spreads, 30 basis points. That's a nice, nice user experience. I use it myself. Sent money to the United States. It's available the same day. Fantastic. At a, at a guaranteed rate. Even better. Now, if it's usable person to person, business to business. You talk to a treasurer of an international technology company who is, you know, buying chips in Taiwan and has to pay the research center in Tel Aviv. Well, they probably have three bank accounts in Taiwan because they need to be sure that they can make the payment to pay for the chips so the chips get on the boat to meet the just-in-time needs of their supply chain. What about in Israel when you have to pay the shekels to the, the local research team, these PhD cryptographers that are designing your next generation systems? Well, you probably need three bank accounts there as well in case a glitch happens and a payment gets stuck because people don't go to work if they don't get paid, right? Now, once you talk about business to business payments, you can put automated things like um, what's called cash pooling, this automated liquidity management for large companies that, are, that manage big pools of capital around the world. So you can move that capital instantly, sweep it on top of it. Again, difficult to do on existing uh, analog transaction rails, but the future, which will be 24 7, 365, you can automate a lot of this. And then when you get into the um, capital market side of things, almost every single business process in capital markets, cross currency swaps, um, syndicated loans, structured products, trade finance, bonds, equities, derivatives, slow, costly, error prone, by and large, the size of the back office is the indicator that the answer is yes, right? And we know this we've, in banking. Um, but we've, we've lived with it and we've kind of accepted it. <coughs> no longer, because we can't. And the reason why we can't in banking accept this any longer is as an industry, our return on tangible equity, ROTE, which is the measure, is lower than our cost of capital as an industry. And there are too many banks. That's unsustainable. That means we don't, we're, we're, we're in, it's hard to survive if your return on equity is lower than your cost of capital. It doesn't make any sense. So we have, we have to figure out how to reduce costs, number one. And part of the story there is potentially blockchain systems for uh, shared infrastructure why, why, should we, why should three banks build the same infrastructure? Why don't we just share the same infrastructure? We're still going to compete with each other on products and services, go to market with different ideas and concepts. Anyway, so when you look in a bank, any, tra any transaction process which is slow, costly, and error prone is probably a good target. All right, so where are we? Um, hang on a second. In 2014, the very first bank study was conducted by Banco Santander, uh, titled, and this is it's publicly available now, it's called, it was titled The Impact of Cryptocurrencies on Banks. At the time, banks were worried about Bitcoin. And they submitted a tender out to the world to find a consultant to do that study. I was the consultant that was selected to do the study. I, 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 I found a job, but I didn't know that at the time. And the conclusion of the study was simple enough in that it's not about the coin, it's not about the Bitcoin, it's about the ledger. It's about this idea of a shared universal source of truth that we could, we could trust. Then going from 2014, there was a lot of proofs of concept, prototypes into 2016. 2017, we started to see real money pilots um, supported by a lot of the consulting firms started getting interested, whether it's you know, Deloitte or Graham Thornton or Consensus, and, and, and like, there's a lot of expertise out there now. Um, last year, we formally made the decision, let's take some of this to production, which actually means now out of the lab and have to go through the new products committee, 11 separate subcommittees, each one has 10 people, none of whom understand technology, all of whom have the power to say no, none of them have the incentive to say yes. I don't know why I took on that job, actually. But, uh, we got here. Um, and additionally, you have to work with the regulators. Santander, we're a Spanish bank. Uh, local regulators, Banco de España at the central bank level uh, as a proxy for European Central Bank. And then the CNMV, which is the Spanish equivalent of the FCA or the uh, SEC, it's the securities regulator. So before you can do anything real, you have to sit down with everybody internally, all the lawyers, 15 internal attorneys. I'm not popular in the legal department. <laughs> We had outside counsel, uh, actually Allen and Overy, Madrid office of ANO and London office of ANO. Um, it was complicated to figure out how do we actually take these things live. And now um, the first live platforms that are blockchain based or distributed ledger based are available. 
incrementally. And you as a user, so as a user, I, I take out my Banco Santander app here, and if I want to send euros to dollars, I as a user, all I see, I don't see any blockchain, I don't see anything complicated. <coughs> all I see is rate, midpoint is X, X plus 30 basis points, which is almost nothing, and I can send it to be in my account same day. That's great. There's a nice user experience, the speed. Um, so the idea here is that blockchain is just infrastructure. You as clients, whether retail, corporate, small and medium enterprises, you'll never see any of this. It's just infrastructure underneath. Kind of like the chips in your phone are just infrastructure. Use your phone, you don't think about the chips, right? Um, I do, but that's because, <laughs> that's because I'm weird. <laughs> anyway, um, so we, uh, Banco Santander, six weeks ago, we issued a, a digital bond. This gets a bit technical, and I'm going to apologize in advance, but some of you in the audience will understand exactly what this means. We issued a digital bond, a bond that's represented on the public Ethereum blockchain as a digital token. The bond itself is a set of rights and obligations to cash flow, but ownership of the bond is recorded on a blockchain instead of at a CSD, Central Securities Depository. $20 million, dollar denominated, financially inconsequential. But at a bank, whether it's one dollar or a billion dollars, you still have to go to the new products committee and all the regulators. So we picked a number that was sizable enough to be meaningful, but if there was a problem, that the risk wasn't so high. One year maturity, uh, four coupons, quarterly coupons, and a fixed rate of interest of 1.98% priced right off our yield curve. Nothing special about this. Vanilla bond. Four legal entities, four separate legal entities of the bank involved in the transaction. Banco Santander SA, which is the corporate parent in Madrid, was the issuer. On the investor side, Santander Securities Services Treasury, which is a Spanish custodian, but their treasury group was the investor. I worked for the dealer, so in that regard, I was a bond salesman that day, a bad one probably. And then underneath all of this, to make it all work as the custodian, Santander Security Services, which is actually licensed and regulated in custod a custodian in Spain. Now, custody in this new world changes. A custodian's responsibility relates to custody of cryptographic keys, these long random numbers which control digital assets. That's kind of technical. Uh, custody of the digital cash, because we didn't just digitize the security, we also digitized the cash. Stable coins, we talked about that earlier where you take real money on deposit in a bank account. So the money's in a bank account, and then you create digital tokens that are backed by the real money in the bank account. It's like going to an amusement arcade. You put 10 bucks in, you get 10 bucks of tokens. It's backed by real money. Maybe you can redeem them at the end. Same thing with digital money. Real money in a bank account, create digital tokens to represent that cash. And now you've got digital cash, and you can use that to transact. And actually, Facebook, here? Yes, sorry, I can't see. Um, Facebook made an announcement back in June related to Libra. This idea you could build a payment system on a blockchain where you create a digital token backed by a basket of currencies where the basket of currencies, pounds, euros, dollars, Canadian dollars, Singapore dollars, I think was the mix, something like that. Yeah. It was close. <laughs> but the real cash would be on deposit in custody accounts in banks around the world, and then there's a kind of a digital token that sits on top. Very powerful, compelling concept. Not new, a consumer-facing SDR, special drawing right from the IMF, which has been talked about since the 1960s. Banks haven't failed to deliver it. Shame on us. Not new, but very provocative. And I think something like this is going to come into existence for sure. If it isn't Facebook, it'll be the Chinese. The Europeans, we won't be able to move fast enough. Which, God, is unfortunate. Anyway. Number nine on the list here is we use the public, so there's lots of blockchains out there. The two big ones, number one is Bitcoin, which is just a payment system really, and the one that's most interesting from my point of view in the public world is Ethereum. Why? It's programmable. You can do cool things with it. So we were able to create a digital representation of a security, a bond, a digital representation of cash. We were able to then take the digital cash, digital, digital bond, and in the blockchain perform what's known as delivery versus payment. This idea that you can exchange value, cash for an investment, simultaneously, irrevocably, and instantly. And you, that's called delivery versus payment. And usually we rely on an entity called a CCP, a central clearing party, to perform that. Why? Because if you're an issuer of a security and you're an investor, you want to make sure that the transaction happens instantly. It's not fair if the issuer 
ends up with both the cash and the security at the same time, you need to verify that the transaction happens. In blockchain terminology, we call that ato atomicity, atomic. It's cool. <laughs> yeah. Smart atomic smart contracts. <laughs> Great name for a rock band. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but here's the flows of how something like this works. Uh, we've got the issuer of the security, we've got the investor in security, and the custodian. Green lines represent real cash, real money. This is the stuff, well, that matters. Red lines represent digital money. So the first step is that the investor takes $20 million of real money, and they send it to a custody account at the custodian. Real money, dollars to dollars. The custodian then verifies, I got the dollars from the investor, custodian creates digital tokens that represent the cash on deposit in that custody account and sends the tokens back to the investor. That's called tokenization. Investor sends cash, investor gets tokens. Now I'm an investor, I've got $20 million of digital cash, what am I gonna do with it? Well, I'd like to invest it. In the future, there'll be many digital securities to invest in, but today there was only one, and the one was, the one that we issued, a uh, digital bond from Michael Santander. And what happens then is very simply that the investor chooses to invest the money in the bond, the digital tokens flow to the issuer of the bond, and the bond itself flows to the investor. And that's done on the blockchain in this kind of simultaneous or replicable exchange of title uh, called delivery versus payment. Now there's a problem. The issuer has $20 <coughs> million dollars of digital tokens. What can they do with it? Nothing. In the future, they'd be able to invest that digital cash into another security. But today, there was nothing else to do. So the, the issuer now with the $20 million of digital tokens needs to redeem the tokens for real cash. Super simple. They send the tokens back to the custodian. That's red line number five. Custodian destroys the tokens, sends them to the zero address. And then the custodian transfers the real cash via SWIFT, which is the message system we use to do that, transfers the real cash from the custody account to the cash account of the issuer. Full cycle takes about an hour. Traditionally, in today's world, this process usually is T plus three. It takes three days to verify. A lot of paperwork. So you go from T3, issuer now has cash available instantly instead of three days or five days later, to T0, which is instant. Capital optimization, quite useful, right, on the issuer side. Anyway, I won't get into the rest. Now this tokenization concept, this is a little bit cumbersome because it's kind of a fudge for something bigger that is coming, known as central bank digital currency, CBDC. And that's when central banks can issue digital currency themselves. So there's currently a central bank, there's two types of central bank money. There's cash, which is in your pocket. That's central bank money. That's kind of a claim against the central bank, although it doesn't really represent anything. It used to represent gold. Today it represents nothing. Kind of hard to get your head money. It's just a faith-based faith concept. Um, and then we've got cash, and then we've got reserve accounts. That's kind of the electronic money that's in the central bank, held on behalf of banks. Well, in the future, central banks will be able to issue directly to individu or individuals or to institutions digital versions of central bank money. So we at Banco Santander and 15 other financial institutions, Credit Suisse, UBS in Switzerland, um, KBC, ING, Commerce Bank, Santander, Eurozone, Barclays, Lloyds, Pounds, Bank of New York, Mellon, State Street, NASDAQ, Dollars, CIBC, Canadian Dollars, MUFG, Mizuho, SMBC, Japanese Yen. 15 banks have been working on creating central bank digital currency as a consortium for the last three and a half years. I've been working on this for three and a half years. Quietly, the central banks had said to us, shh, say nothing. And then our friends at Facebook announced Libra, and all of a sudden, thank you, by the way, for, 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 because we were allowed to talk about what we've been doing. And Finality International, which was previously known as we called the Project Utility Settlement Coin, because we're blockchainers, and that's a cool word, cool name. Um, but the idea that you can take real cash on deposit in a central bank, central bank money. Now, central bank money is unique because it's got zero counterparty risk, zero credit risk, and settlement finality. 
on my commercial bank money. The money in your bank account, by the way, is not central bank money, it's commercial bank money, it's subject to creditors. You have to trust that your financial institution ain't going to go under. There was a time when we had a lot of trust. I think we have less trust than we do today, which is one of the reasons why we have government insurance on bank accounts. Anyway, take real money on deposit in a central bank, tokenize it, create digital tokens, and now all of a sudden on a, on a shared ledger, a distributed ledger system, and now all of a sudden you have the ability to settle between banks wholesale, because this is a wholesale system, a billion dollars any time of the day or night, 24-7, 365. I want to settle a billion yen on midnight on a Saturday night. I can't do it today. Why? Because the central bank payment systems, known as real-time growth settlement systems, RTGS, have windows. Target 2 in Europe is open 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday to Friday. So those are the, that's your banking hours. You can't, you can't go to the bank and make a payment after 6 o'clock on a Friday. With tokenized money, you can do it any time. And when you add some of the extra characteristics of programmability and security, multi-currency, so the initial target for Finality International, which is the name of the company now that was incorporated back in May of this year when we and the 15 other banks put $60 million behind it. Um, the first live currency will probably be available for testing purposes, if we're lucky, Q3, Q2, Q3, 2020. Much closer than anybody actually thought. Why? Because we've been working on it for three and a half years. <coughs> and thanks to Facebook now, and I really mean that, this topic has gone to the very top of the highest <coughs> levels of the regulators and central banks, whether that's ECB, Bank of England, Federal Reserve, Bank of China, Bank of International Settlements, which is the central bank of central banks in Basel and Switzerland. This is a hot topic. And it's going to happen. And it has all kinds of implications for transaction processes in banks. We will have a new settlement rail with certain unique characteristics. What are we going to do about that? Don't know yet. And longer term, something like Finality International can be used multi-currency, the rail, the payments rail, in dollars, pounds, euros, Canadian, Japanese yen, for security settlements, exchange and clearing, trade finance, we could imagine, for instance, a use case potentially, what we trade does currently is manage the workflow between buyers and sellers in an international transaction to minimize the open account risk, right, instead of letters of credit. It doesn't have a payment system, though. <coughs> the payment system is traditional rails. We could, in theory, imagine a world where finality plugs in as the payment rail. Um, Issuance of securities, delivery versus payment, I talked a bit about that. Collateral management, banks have pools of collateral. When we do a transaction with another bank, we have to post collateral against it. Uh, and then all kinds of things like cross-border payments, whether it's person-to-person, business-to-business, or fully automated uh, cash management solutions. <coughs> now, having said all of that, Dilbert always says it, says it best. <laughs> One of the reasons why blockchain technology has been moving more slowly than we would like is because we've gotten distracted. Blockchain everywhere, oh my God. Job security for guys like me. But the truth is that only certain transaction processes and workflows would genuinely benefit from shared ledger blockchain type solutions. And we need to be pragmatic about what those are. And our job today as uh, technologists, let's say, in financial institutions or in large corporations or in consulting firms, having done all of our proofs of concept and our research and development and exploration over the last few years is to figure out, okay, what are these use cases? And there's a, there's a narrow few we'll, where we'll start <coughs> and we'll go from there. I hope I didn't take too long. Muchas gracias a todos. Um, and I'll take any questions that you might have.